All right, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to welcome you to our uh, joint WWF Israel workshop on the, should I say, uh, green limits of blue growth in the deep sea. Well, it is a great pleasure and honor to speak to such an audience here and also to have the possibility after the presentations to have a common and mutual discussion, hopefully a fruitful one, after the presentations. So I would also like to ask you to abstain from questions during the presentations, also to keep in time a little, and you have noticed that we have a very tight schedule. Thank you. Well, it is also a pleasure that the European Commission has organized such an event here in Bremen to get all the stakeholders together and interested parties, and we are happy to uh, have this um, workshop to deal with this very issue. So welcome here, and thank you for coming. I would also like to thank WWF for the very good cooperation uh, when organizing this workshop. So thank you very much both to Zabine and uh, also to Stefan. Thank you. Um, well, before we start uh, right after my presentation with the more substantive presentations uh, from dear fellow experts, I would also like to introduce you to the legal status of the seabed and subsoil within and beyond national jurisdiction. This introductory part is basically meant for those of, of you who uh, are uh, not or less familiar with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. And uh, UNCLOS is indeed the very basis for all marine activities. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is the result of three UN conferences and uh, was adopted in 1982. Uh, after quite a while of negotiations between 1973 and 82, and it took even more, uh, even 12 years more to, uh, uh, well, for UNCLOS to enter into force. So it is uh, considered as the constitution for the oceans. So basically, uh, it is the starting point for all legal reflections on any marine activity. So when it comes to our very topic here today, one of the focus areas of the European Union and uh, the European Commission with regard to blue growth, as uh, Stefan Luther already told you, uh, was um, uh, or is this is seabed mining and the exploration for and the exploitation of uh, mineral resources um, well, no matter if solid, liquid, or gaseous, may be conducted in different maritime zones. So in areas beyond, as well as in areas within national jurisdiction. But they fall under different legal regimes. So this is what is my small introductory part is about. This is a little sketch, you could say, of the different maritime zones. And we are going to look into that uh, uh, both from a, a horizontal as well as a vertical perspective. So when it comes to, to the horizontal perspective, you could say that the areas within national jurisdiction you might know are the territorial sea, the exclusive economic zone, and the continental shelf. And when it comes to, the, uh, to areas beyond national jurisdiction, we do have the high seas and the area. So this is basically when you start from land outwards uh, into, the, into the sea, you could say. So this is the horizontal perspective. But the more uh, interesting uh, perspective probably in our respect here is the vertical perspective. Um, and uh, this is now the vertical perspective uh, covering uh, the areas within national jurisdiction. So when it comes to the territorial sea, the continuous zone and the exclusive economic zone, uh, 
it is important to remember that we are speaking about the water column and the surface. And uh, when it comes from, well, starting with the territorial sea and then going outbound uh, into the sea, uh, we do have sovereignty and then sovereign rights and jurisdictions. So you could say that by leaving land, the land masses, uh, you usually lose the power or jurisdiction, as the, the legal people say, uh, with regard to the coastal state. Um, on the other hand, uh, we do speak about the seabed and subsoil, which is called continental shelf. This is a, a, a legal definition. So uh, those of you of a natural science background uh, might excuse here. This uh, might seem to be uh, a little uh, unclear, but the legal definition of uh, the continental shelf is not the same as in natural sciences. So the legal definition of the continental shelf uh, um, ends, you could say, uh, in, the, in the area within national jurisdiction. So there we have sovereign rights. When it comes then uh, to the uh, uh, second part of the vertical perspective, which is uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction, it comes to the high seas, which is again the water column and the surface. And there we have the high seas freedoms. And these high, high seas freedoms do cover a lot of uh, freedoms like uh, maritime shipping, like laying cables and pipelines and uh, uh, conducting um, uh, marine scientific research and so on. So that is something which uh, uh, is, uh, well, you could say, uh, um, well, or, uh, well, you could say a, a position of the of the past. It's about 400 years old. Uh, some of you might might uh, um, well think about Hugo Grotius, uh, who was a legal scholar in 1609. Uh, well, presenting these high seas freedoms. But the most important thing is that uh, beneath the, the high seas, we do have the area which is of uh, key interest when it comes to uh, deep seabed uh, mining. And there we speak about the seabed and ocean floor and subsoil thereof. And they fall under the common heritage of mankind. Um, we will learn much more about that during the uh, more substantive sessions, as I already said. So uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Ximena Hinrichs, who is the head of the legal office of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. She will then introduce you to the international perspective of deep seabed mining. Thank you very much.